Hello class, uh, back for lecture number 11 for History 102. Uh, we left off with uh, the first C of the square deal, uh, control of corporations, uh, and talked about uh, Roosevelt or TR, the trust buster. So now we want to pick up with the second C of Theodore Roosevelt's square deal. That's consumer protection. Now, this is the big year for consumer protection in American history and in the Roosevelt administration is going to be 1906. Now, there's some events that lead to this. And early in 1906, uh, Europe stunned America by making an announcement that the European market would no longer import any meat or meat products from the United States. And their claim was that the meat was tainted and was making Europeans sick, even killing them. So they're shutting off U.S. meat products from their markets. This stunned America, but then Americans quickly figured out that this was actually the case. Now, the meatpacking industry was centered in Chicago because of the railroads and the cattle drives to the West and so forth, and it really emerged into a giant industry. Completely unregulated, and uh, there was a lot of suspicion about was, what was going on in the meatpacking industry, and one charge against them was that they treated their employees horribly, that they made them work very long hours, tried to make them work faster and faster, and it was a pretty dangerous operation, slaughtering cattle and other animals. And it was routine for somebody who worked in a meatpacking industry to be missing a finger or two because they cut them off being either too tired or being forced to work too quickly. So this is where a muckraking journalist who's a, a progressive journalist, and remember Roosevelt coined the term, comes into play. And you've probably heard of him before. His name is Upton Sinclair. He's going to investigate the meatpacking industry from the perspective of how they abuse their employees. Now, the, he, to do this, and this was typical of muckraking journalists, he got a job at a meatpacking plant. So he could see firsthand what was going on in there. So, what he does is he gets this job, and remember, initially, he's just looking at working conditions. Uh, it's not just the working conditions that stuns him. It's the complete lack of sanitation in processing meat in these plants in Chicago. And out of this investigati investigation, he's going to write his most famous book, that many of you might have had to read in high school, that book is The Jungle. Now, The Jungle is going to shock America. I want to read you an excerpt from The Jungle, give you an idea of what's in it for those of you who aren't familiar with the book. I'd encourage you to read it. Uh, Upton Sinclair writes about what it was like in one of these plants. He writes, there would be meat stored in great piles and rooms, and the water from leaky roofs would drip over it, and thousands of rats would race about on it. It was too dark in these storage places to see well, but a man could run his hand over these piles of meat and sweep off handfuls of dried dung of rats. These rats were nuisances and the packers would put poison bread out for them. They would die, and then rats, bread, and meat would go into the hoppers together. That was what made sausage. Combination of meat, poison bread, and dead rats. Grind it up, you got sausage. And that was commonplace. There's another interesting story out of the book that I'd relate to you uh, 
and it was more into the working conditions, but it also is a, you know, a stunning uh, uncovery of what's going on. Uh, there was a worker at the factory that Sinclair worked at, and we'll say, I, I don't remember his name, let's say it's Fred. Fred was a very dedicated worker, never missed work, never called in sick. And all of a sudden, he's not showing up to work. Uh, he misses an entire week and some of his fellow employees become very worried about what's wrong with Fred. Is he sick? Did he die? What happened? So they went to his house and his family wondered the same. He disappeared off the face of the earth. They hadn't seen him in a week either, and that's not like Fred. They'd been looking for him, filed a missing report on him, and so forth. So, come to find out, and, and this is how part of this meatpacking process worked. They would also can meat, and you'd buy diff cans, canned beef, canned pork. I mean, they still sort of make something like, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of Spam before. Something like that, too, out of pigs. What they would do is they would take the uh, carcasses or skeletons of beef cattle and other animals like pigs and so forth, and they'd put the bones that might have a little bit of meat still on them in these giant brine vats, big gigantic vats of brine, which is salt water. And they would sit there in these vats for a long time. And ultimately, the brine would cause what meat was left on the bones to fall off the bones. Then periodically, they drain the vat, remove all the bones. Then at the bottom would be this meat, and this is what they'd can. Now, uh, this process goes on, one of these vats are drained, and lo and behold, it's not just beef cattle bones in there, they find the skeleton of Fred. He had fallen into the vat, died, and decomposed in there. So, I suppose in the past, maybe that's part of what these canned meats were that the Europeans didn't want to consume anymore. So Theodore Roosevelt reads The Jungle, a bestseller at the time. As soon as he's done reading it, he holds a press conference and he basically tells America, uh, after reading The Jungle, he has become an instantaneous vegetarian. And he encourages all other Americans not to consume any meat products until the federal government does something about this horrible problem. So, in response, the uh, government is going to pass the Meat Inspection Act of 1906, which sets up all the rules of sanitation uh, many of which still ex exist today, uh, creates a whole army of government inspectors, creates the FDA to oversee all this. And this is uh, still, uh, you know, the, the beginning of a program that exists today that all of our uh, meat processing plants across America have to follow these rules and regulations. This was a great breakthrough for consumer protection, the second C. 1906 is also a big year uh, as far as regulating uh, other parts of the food and drug uh, manufacturers in America. Back in this day and age, there were basically no labels on anything. I mean, if you bought a can of corn it's not going to tell you on there what's in there besides the corn. They weren't required to list the ingredients. Uh, same for drugs. And during this time period, uh, you also had a problem with uh, a lot of so-called doctors who would travel around the country in what was known as their traveling medicine shows and they all would be selling their bottles of their magic elixirs. 
that were supposed to cure everything under the sun and they could make all these wild claims without, without anything backing them up. And uh, they didn't have to list the ingredients in these magic elixirs or tonics. And they came in small bottles, typically sold for a buck a piece. And uh, this so-called doctor would travel from town to town, selling them out of the back of his wagon, claiming they cured everything from asthma to uh, arthritis. And, you know, they'd even have shills in the audience who would give false testimonies about how it cured all their ills and so forth. Well, a lot of people were getting sick from these. So the government decided to buy a whole bunch of different ones, do a analysis on them, and see what was actually in them. And when they figured out what was really in these magic elixirs, the number one ingredient in all of them was alcohol. And in most of them, the second top ingredient was morphine. So basically what they were was little flasks of a morphine cocktail. So I suppose if you did take a couple teaspoons of that regularly every day, you certainly weren't feeling any pain, but obviously it wasn't curing the base root of your illness. So the government in response to this and the lack of labeling on other foods too, in 1906, we'll pass the Pure Food and Drug Act that Theodore Roosevelt will sign into law, which makes everything have labels as to what their ingredients are so that you know what you're putting into your bodies. Another breakthrough for consumer protection. Now, the next thing we want to talk about is the last C of Theodore Roosevelt's square deal, and that's... Theodore Roosevelt, the conservationist, or as we would call him today, the environmentalist. The term environmentalist didn't exist back then. Now, what Roosevelt always had a fondness for nature. As we know, uh, he was hiking and camping in the Adirondacks when, uh, you know, President McKinley was assassinated. And Roosevelt, being very familiar with the Adirondacks, was also keenly aware of how endangered the Adirondacks were. And remember, the Adirondack Park didn't come into creation until the 1890s. And a lot of people don't realize what went on in the Adirondacks before the preservation efforts came about by the state of New York. The Adirondacks had been logged and in fact, back in this day and age, they used to use a technique known as clear cutting. The Adirondacks had been clear cut twice in its history before the 1890s. So in reality, when you go hiking out in the Adirondacks today, what you're seeing is a third growth forest. The natural stands of virgin timber in the Adirondacks are far and few between and very few spots are preserved of natural uh, trees in the Adirondacks, which were white pines. There's a very impressive stand of virgin white pine trees, some of them over 500 years old, uh, near Paul Smith's College. I've been to that stand before because a friend of mine's a professor there. He took me and it's amazing to see a 500 year old white pine tree, how gigantic it is. And it's kind of fun to sit under one and imagine who walked by this tree within the last 500 years? Now, Theodore Roosevelt wants to preserve our forests, first and foremost. And he's going to utilize a law that was passed in 1891 known as the Forest Reserve Act. This allowed presidents to set aside tracts of federal land and turn them into national forests. Now, this was created in 1891, and uh, during the time period that uh, from 1891 to 1901, when Theodore Roosevelt was sworn in as president, 46 million acres were set aside and became national forests as a result of this brand new piece of legislation, the Forest Reserve Act. Uh, 
Theodore Roosevelt, between the time he took office in September of 1901 and when he left office in March of 1909, preserved 125 million acres of forest land uh, that became national forests. So essentially, he preserved nearly three times the amount in much less time as his predecessors. He was a champion of the forest. And to give you an idea of how committed he was to this, in uh, December of 1902, he made a stunning announcement to the country in one of his speeches. He announced that he was banning Christmas trees from the White House because he believed that the cutting of natural Christmas trees was one of the most monumental wastes of natural resources in this country. Because what happened back in this day and age is armies of young men would go into places like the Adirondacks in November and cut young pine trees. They'd put them on trains and send them to cities like New York and Philadelphia and sell them in the Christmas tree lots. This was cutting trees that were just taking off, you know, typically a, a tree that's cut in a Christmas tree lot is somewhere between six and 10 years old. These could be giant trees later. And Roosevelt thought it was a monumental waste. Uh, he uh, is going to ban this practice. Uh, today, obviously, it's a whole different thing because Christmas trees are raised on farms like a crop. And part of the reason why that evolved and why other forest preservation uh, practices took place was because of Roosevelt's top advisor when it came to forest preservation, a man by the name of Gifford Pinchot. Pinchot is spelled P-I-N-C-H-O-T. He was the head of the Federal Division of Forestry under the Interior Department, and he was Roosevelt's top advisor on forest preservation. He was a pioneer in the field because he's one of the uh, foresters who uh, came up with the idea of selective harvesting, planting three trees for every tree you cut, and so forth, were all Pinchot's brainchilds. Now, uh, also, as far as Theodore Roosevelt, the conservation or environmentalist goes, we're going to want to look in our books on page 662, 663. Uh, take a look at that photograph of loggers in the state of Washington in 1901. Look how gigantic that tree is. That's either a giant sequoia uh, or a giant Douglas fir up in the state of Washington. Look how huge it is compared to those loggers. Now, uh, Roosevelt is going to be a big advocate of another movement that's really taken off in America, environmentally related. That's the National Park Movement. Now, we mentioned when we talked about Chief Joseph that Yellowstone National Park already existed. During this time, more and more parks are coming online, many thanks to Theodore Roosevelt signing declarations to deem them as national parks. And during his uh, presidency, one summer he took a tour of the West to look at present national parks and potential future ones. He spent over a week camping in Yellowstone and loved every minute of it. I uh, then traveled to the Grand Canyon, which was not yet a national park. He was instrumental in getting it deemed for preservation as a national park. Then another one of his destinations was a place that was in danger at the time and was not yet deemed a national park, one of our greatest national parks, Yosemite in Northern California. Now, when Roosevelt travels to Yosemite for his tour, uh, he stays at the Grand Lodge at Yosemite. And that evening, he was supposed to make a speech to leading Republicans from California that was sort of a fundraiser speech for the Republican Party in the state. 
Now, uh, one thing I want to make clear right now that I really hadn't mentioned with progressives, the progressive movement swept across political parties. There were Republican progressives like Theodore Roosevelt and Taft. There were Democrat progressives like Woodrow Wilson. It didn't really care about what party you were in. Progressives touched every aspect of our society. So back to what happens at Yosemite. Theodore Roosevelt's all scheduled to make this keynote address at this boring dinner, as far as he's concerned. And he tells his advisors to tell these Republican big shots that all this travel's taken the most out of him. He's not feeling uh, very good that evening. He was just going to go to his room and get some sleep. What he actually did was meet the gentleman who's pictured on page 662 standing next to Theodore Roosevelt, the famous, uh, the famous conservationist and pioneer of the environmentalist movement, John Muir. Now, it had already been arranged that John Muir was going to meet him and they and a couple of Roosevelt's aides were going to go hiking out into Yosemite because John Muir was the biggest advocate for the protection of Yosemite and making it become the next national park. So they go hiking and they hike until nightfall. Then they sit up at a campfire we into the wee hours discussing the future of Yosemite, what a beautiful place it is. And Muir said, wait till you see uh, the parts I'm going to show you tomorrow. The two of them then, all they had, they didn't even have tents. They just had their sleeping bags with them. And his two advisors went to sleep that night next to the campfire. And in the morning, Roosevelt recall, recalls in his memoirs, he woke up with a couple inches of snow on top of his sleeping bag. So when he gets up and makes some coffee at the campfire and looks where he is, because he couldn't see it, they arrived there when it was dark. If you look behind that photograph of Roosevelt and Muir, in the background is Yosemite Falls. They were camped up on this spot across from Yosemite Falls. So in the morning, it be, as the fog clears, it becomes visual and Roosevelt can't believe his eyes. This is what convinces him to designate most of this area of Yosemite as a national park, and it's one of the greatest parks in the country today with some of the highest visitation rates uh, of any national park. So Roosevelt did his part for preservation of forests, preservation of lands, national parks. Theodore Roosevelt was truly our very first environmentalist, or as they were known back then, conservationist president. So that sums up the three C's of the square deal. That's it for me today. I'm getting hoarse. I've lectured enough. So next time when we pick up, we'll wrap up Roosevelt's stay in the White House, talk about the election of 1904 and 1908, and lead on into the Taft and Wilson administrations. So everybody take care. I hope you have a good weekend. And follow the governor's orders. New York on pause has been extended for another two weeks. Stay home as much as possible. Everybody take care. Be safe. Bye for now.